Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in tonight. My name is Alex Adamson. I am the executive director here at WISE, and we are so excited to have you all here to chat a little bit about end of year sprint selling um, as we are in the throes of Q4. Um, we have two amazing panelists, two strategic AEs from um, two of our favorite sponsor companies joining us to chat a little bit about this tonight. Uh, I know we have some folks trickling in, feel free to introduce yourselves, um, throw in where you're tuning in from. I This is um, at, a, at a PST, a Pacific time, uh, time slot, but it looks like we have some folks coming in from the East Coast as well. So welcome everybody, thanks so much for being here. For anyone who's tuning in that is new to WISE, um, WISE is a global community building the next generation of female sales leaders. Um, our mission and what we do every day, bringing content to women around the world, connecting women from around the world would not be possible if it weren't for our incredible sponsors. So huge shout out to Salesloft, Segment, Udemy, Better, Pendo, HubSpot, Rapid7, Okta, Handshake, SciSense, FreshBooks, and Datadog. Um, all of these sponsors are incredible places to work. They are incredible places with female sales leaders. Um, most are hiring as well. So if you ever are interested in learning more about these companies, you can go to the, the WISE website, click on the company's page, there are job openings there. Um, if you ever have questions, feel free to reach out to me as well. And, and we're happy to connect you with anyone at any of these companies. Um, so without further ado, I'm very excited to welcome our two panelists. We have Katie Mooney, who's a strategic AE over at Handshake, and we have Paige Montecalvo, strategic AE over at Salesloft. Hi, ladies. Hi. So great to be here. Hello. Um, so I am going to kick it over to you, Katie, to introduce yourself and tell everyone tuning in a little bit about you and, and your role over at Handshake. Great. Well, first and foremost, thanks everyone for being here with us tonight. Uh, please pour yourself a nice glass of Cabernet or, or your selection before we get started. It's a very important part of this experience. Uh, so cheers to all of you. I, as Alex mentioned, am a strategic AE at Handshake. For a little bit on how I got here, I actually studied to be a, a pre-med at Stanford. I was a human biology major. And as with many of you, I accidentally fell into sales. I actually started my career selling mortgage-backed securities at Goldman Sachs. I know all of your dream. Uh, and after that, spent some time over at JP Morgan in their private bank. After I found that that whole financial situation was a little less uh, soul-fulfilling for me, I wanted to switch over to the education space. So I found this amazing company called Raise Me, uh, where that really kicked off my sales career. So I started there as a AE. After a while, I became their director of sales, and I ended up leaving there as their VP of sales. It was a really small company. During my time there, we went from about 20 to 60, and we helped college students navigate that high school or that high school students navigate their high school to college path. So it was really about building more financial aid transparency within that process. So it was actually a very natural transition when I left there to join Handshake. I joined as our first sales director. Uh, I led our SDR team, our commercial sales team, and our mid-market team over time and have gotten to see our sales team go from a mighty 14 to over 40, 50 now. So it's been quite exciting. Uh, in February, I decided to take a step out of my manager experience that I've had for the past handful of years and took on this strategic AE role. So it's been really fun to get back into selling, and I'm excited to share some of that with all of you today. Uh, I now work on covering about 20 of the Fortune 100 companies, so the big guys out there. Uh, I have a two parts to my role in this strategic seat. I work with some companies that already pay us, actually, so more of that account manager role. And then the majority are what you're all very familiar with, uh, net new. So companies that don't pay us yet, and I try to get them to pay us. So that's my role, and Alex, I'll hand it back to you. Thanks, Katie, that was great. Um, Paige, welcome. Uh, we'd, we'd love to hear a little bit more about you. Yeah, hi everyone, I'm Paige Montecalvo. I'm a strategic account exec at Salesloft, and I've been there about a year and a half now. Um, I've actually been in enterprise sales for the majority of my career. Uh, in fact, my first job out of college was at Corporate Executive Board, uh, selling to division CEOs. 
I'm going to age myself here a little bit, but I was like cold calling the CEO of women's Nike wear at 23 years old before LinkedIn existed. So truly off of a, uh, some Excel spreadsheet that was created, God knows where, uh, just kind of uh, dial in for dollars, if you will. And, and I always look back at that time and think it's really interesting that I was, um, I was like not ready. I didn't even know better at the time. I was not ready to be making cold calls to the CEO of women's Nike wear uh, or of Nike women's wear rather. Um, but, you know, it really kind of uh, pushed me off the deep end uh, in my sales career. So started there. Uh, I've really kind of gone back and forth over time between kind of more of the AM roles, AE roles. I've been in hybrid roles, which is what my role here at uh, Sales Loft is right now. Um, but I've always worked in the enterprise uh, and maybe I'm a glutton for punishment, but I, I love the complexity of the enterprise deals. I love chasing the big the big deals and the big logos. Um, interestingly, the majority of my career was spent selling to uh, CIOs, tech companies, uh, CDOs, that type of role. And here at Sales Lab, this is really my first time selling to sellers and it has been really a refreshing experience. And I've also wondered how I've survived a decade of sales without Sales Loft, because this is actually the first company I've ever worked at that actually has a sales and engagement tool. So it's been it's been a game changer to see what that does for businesses. And it's been a lot of fun to be a part of, uh, I'll call it really an innovative kind of landscape marketplace changing uh, product. And that's it's been a lot of fun and a, and a huge learning experience for me. Um, you know, lastly, there's just there have been so many times where I'm the only woman or the youngest woman in the room. And I feel like earlier in my career and, you know, have to catch myself even now sometimes where, you know, you've wasted time feeling like you're not important enough to be in the room. And then I had two daughters and I realized I never wanted them to feel that way. So I really love mentoring young women. I love being a part of groups like this. And I'm just really excited to be taking part in this conversation tonight. That's great. Thank you both so much for being here. I'm really excited about this topic. We actually haven't done this talk but before. Um, and this is something that, that we get pinged about on our anonymous um, channel quite a lot is, you know, how do I balance the, the chaos of end of year, end of quarter, um, while also being really mindful about the long term and not getting too focused on a particular part of my funnel. And so I'm, I'm really excited to chat with both of you, especially because you do both focus on these more strategic accounts. So I think I think this is gonna be great. Um, for anybody tuning in right now, just as a reminder, uh, we'll we'll go through the panel right now. Um, we're gonna we're gonna start with some discussion questions and then we'll get to QA. So please feel free to drop QA either on this sidebar chat here on the right. Um, or you can also drop questions into that ask a question box at the bottom. Um, we'll we'll be sure to get through as many questions as we can at the end, but feel free, please throw them in um, throughout the conversation. And if it makes sense to sprinkle them in during the panel, we will do that. Um, so to start things off, um, Katie, I'm, I'm gonna kick it to you. Uh, you know, Q4 is historically the busiest time of year for salespeople, that's, that's not a secret. Um, what do you find yourself doing differently in Q4, maybe other than than how you you handle things um, in the previous three quarters of the year. Q4 is a crazy time. So I think the craziest thing about it is you think you have the same amount of time that you have in the other quarters and then you don't. And that's because a lot of the people that you want to be there signing your contracts, they go on vacation. And I promise you, everyone would rather be with their friends and family during these holidays than talking to you on the phone. So once we're all real about that, we know that that's also true about how we would like to prioritize. That's what really guides my decision-making process for Q4. So what I'll say about the types of companies that Paige and I work with, they're really big, so they take a long time to do things. So for us, often, we've kind of either won or lost what we've done last quarter. Uh, a lot of what I had to think about was, I think of Thanksgiving as almost my end of year because of the fact that after that, it's just really stressful. <laughs> so if you can plan out for everything to be done before Thanksgiving, knowing it probably won't, but then you've built yourself a buffer, that is the best way uh, I've found for myself to be able to think strategically about this last quarter. That said, for those of you who work with enterprise, mid-market companies, smaller companies, 
for you, 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 this is still a luxury time. So don't feel like if you didn't prepare in Q3 that all hope is lost. You have plenty of time left. Um, I think that the tactical things that make a huge difference during this quarter are just planning. So uh, as my father would always say, failing to plan is planning to fail. So it's all about the pre-work that you put in. And this is something that everybody can do in their account books. And actually, when you're working with companies, I start each quarter by actually building myself a calendar for the entire quarter. I assume in Q4 that nobody is in the office the entire week of Thanksgiving, the entire week of Christmas, and the entire week of New Year's. So if I assume that those weeks are all blocked off, then what I do is I actually work backwards for the deals that I have in, in cycle. And I think about when is realistic for them to sign. If I know that now, or I have some level of uh, commitment timeline from them, I'll put that in the calendar and then I'll work backwards. How long is their legal paperwork procurement adventure going to take? That's going to take a few weeks. Then I'll think about, okay, who do I still need to talk to? And I'll actually map that back week over week so that for each deal, I have a full week over week plan. That tells me then as I go through my quarter, when I'm falling off track, so I don't just leave it to chance of, okay, I'll do that next week. And then I'll just take the next thing the week after I've actually like mapped it to a timeline. So that's really helpful for me. Um, I also think that once a deal has legs, you're able to actually think about what's the best and worst case for all of my different scenarios here. So um, it's good to plan for the worst case. And then when you get the best case, awesome. That's super great. But if you think about creating a risk profile for each uh, deal that you're working on, that can help you prioritize, but also help you think about that week over week plan. So one of the things I like to do is sit back and say, okay, what are the risks in this current deal that I'm working on? Um, is there, do I have the right person involved? Is there someone else whose opinion I haven't thought of yet? Because that's a risk. The, there's a risk that the legal team uh, takes twice as long as they normally take. Okay, what would that look like? There's a risk that uh, they decide that they only have half the budget. Okay, then what does that look like? And if you can work through the deals that you think have legs right now in Q4, you can actually outline what are those risks and then make a plan to mitigate them. So if, for example, there's another person who you haven't talked to yet, how could you get communication to that person now instead of waiting for them to get brought in later? Is there someone in your organization who could reach out to them for you? So I think just really, um, I'm very detail oriented as I'm sure that demonstrated, but for me, I really need like a plan. And so um, as you think about Q4 and as I think about Q4, it's really just in mapping um, how that plays out. I think I think that's really well said, and and to kind of bounce off of that that topic of a plan, um, you know, companies are making plans right now. So Paige, I want to throw it to you. Budgets, fiscal plans, these are the sorts of things executives are thinking about in Q4. These are the things that all companies are thinking about. Um, so how does that change the conversations you're having with customers right now, um, knowing that things inside of their company are changing? Yeah. Um so I actually, when I was thinking about this question, I took it down some of the, the timing and planning. So Katie, that was such a perfect segue into some of the things I was thinking about with this question. So obviously with, you know, my focus being on enterprise strategic deals, you know, I think Katie, you may have already mentioned it. Really, you should be looking at these types of things for budget approval a quarter ahead of time. Um, I would say worst case scenario, you know, early October for us, it's actually November. We're a month offset, which kind of it's a blessing and a curse, I think, um, in, in some ways to have that one month, the Jan 31 uh, annual date. But um, yeah, just making sure that you're have you're again, to Katie's point, backing into those timelines and being realistic about the expectations with your buyers. One of my favorite questions to ask people is, have you ever bought anything at your company before? If you have, tell me about it. Let's talk through what that process is. First, I think that helps keep you out of that uh, tendency to pepper people with questions about their process. Um, and it gets them kind of thinking about a different sales process and telling you about that. And you can really uh, uncover quite a bit, right? So talking through what that process looks like ahead of time, 
who needs to be involved from a budget perspective? Who approves this? Not just, you know, yes, this is your budget, but who actually holds the purse strings? Who signs the check at the end of the day? Um, who can, who has access to the money, right? If you don't have the budget today, then that means you need to find somebody who can go create budget at the company, right? And um, Katie, another good point you had, and, and another thing that I think is a great way to test a champion during this time is to say, you know, it sounds like there might be some others that need to be privy to this conversation or brought into this conversation and a great test and kind of a litmus test for how serious your buyer is um, a, about getting a deal done and sticking to those commitments is bringing in the people that have the power to get the deal done. So I would say, you know, don't be afraid to ask for that up front. Um, and, you know, you can say it in a way that's like, hey, I've done this a lot of time. I've done this many times before, and I know that we're going to come up against this budget issue. If we don't have budget approval, that's going to make it really hard to get anything else done on the deal, to bring in IT resources, to get marketing, whoever else needs to be a part of your deal cycle. It's going to be hard to get resource commitment without budget first. So you know, a, a couple of things. I mean, obviously with timing, Kate, you already, you already mentioned really, really great stuff around that. But then, you know, making sure that you're okay and, and comfortable asking those tough questions of your points of contact and of your champion to, to have them help you along the way to get to get the deal done. And ultimately, it's going to help themselves as well. So, um, you know, with the strategic enterprise play, I would say, uh, Definitely having those conversations, uh, Q2, Q3 is, is going to be really important. If you don't have approval for budgets, you know, by the very beginning of Q4, I would say the deal is, is very likely at risk. Um, you know, that might not be the case uh, with some of the smaller or, or maybe more transactional deals. But again, you're going to have to really focus on backing into that timeline and calling out what those major milestones are. And I would say budget is... Uh, you know, a, a top three item, right, that, that you need to get sorted out beforehand. Yeah, I think that's great. And and you've both touched on, um, you know, these roles that you're currently in as being strategic. So there is a net new component and there's an upsell component. Um, I'd love to hear from from both of you and, and Katie, we can start with you, just how um, you attack those two sorts of deals because they are very different. Um, you know, working with somebody who's who's very new to Handshake versus a company that that's more familiar. Yeah, absolutely. So um, Handshake helps college kids get their first job. That's really the point of what we do. And so the employer side of it is that they're trying to recruit top talent. So that's the the when we when we think about a renewal they either did that last year or they didn't and if they did then it's easy and if they didn't then it's very hard um the reason that they didn't is typically because they didn't use it super well which is our fault right um, but the product works so that's really nice uh for those of you who work in sales you know that's not always the case and so a, a huge relief to work at a company where the product works so the thing about when it comes to just prioritizing that upsell versus net new is that with Q4, uh, it's a little bit different because you kind of know that everything's about to change. <laughs> and so your attention towards net new, you have to think about how does that play out this quarter? And you're kind of gambling, right? Because that account might not be your account in a few months from now. So you become, I become a little more short-sighted on my net new business uh, versus my upsell business. So for myself, I have a handful of accounts whose contract ends in Q4. So they're my top priority right now. I think of them as um, like one in the hand is worth two in the bush, right? Like those are the ones I can't lose. I already know that they liked us at some point or hopefully they like us now. The thing is that with uh, these, I've had a lot of time over the year to work with these companies. So it's way easier from a relationship perspective because they know me, I've been working with them. And if I'm doing my job well, then the renewal is also not a surprise. The net new business in Q4, the only net new business that I'm really working on is either actually an upsell on something that's happened previously in the year, like they're buying a new product from me. Um, and often with that, to touch on a little bit what Paige was talking about with the budgeting piece of things, sometimes companies need to spend budget before end of year. 
So I just I give that little nugget because for those of you uh, where we talk about magic happens in Q4, one of the reasons is that if you don't spend all your budget, some companies will give you less budget next year because they assume you didn't need it. So you'll find that sometimes companies are really excited to give you money at the end of the year and you gotta be ready to pick up that phone call because those are the best kinds. Uh, but that's really what the upsell opportunities tend to be. For my net new business, I've been working with these companies for a very long time by the time we get to Q4. Um, or as, as some of you are taking on like a new career path next year, or hopefully a bunch of you are getting promoted into bigger jobs, the bigger the company you're working with, typically the more complicated their buying process, um, which you'd think they would figure that out because they have more money and they're more sophisticated, but for some reason they don't. So as they get bigger, they actually get a bit more challenging to navigate. Uh, so what that tends to mean is that at the beginning of your sales year, you really got to lean into net new business because if you wait till Q4, you're too late. Um, so that's kind of what I experience in this sales cycle versus your re renewals. You got all year to think and talk about that. So now we're kind of on the other end of that seesaw. So that's how I think about that. Paige, over to you. Paige, you're yeah. not, what would you add? Yeah, I think um, you you covered a lot of great points there. I would agree that, um, you know, the focus in Q4, you should be at a point in Q4 where your big bets are really well known, like your path <laughs> to meeting your number is you, you have one there, right? Um, I will, I will say, I think from a strategic perspective, um, I don't ever want to take my eye off the ball from a prospecting point of view. And, you know, it, it's funny, there was a, there's, we have a guy internally who just got promoted from SDR to AE. And he was like, I've been in SDR for so long. And I swore to myself, when I became a closer, I was never going to let my prospecting slip. And I was going to always be prospecting. And he's like, sure enough, three months in, it's like the first thing that goes on the back burner, right? And that's okay sometimes, but um, you re I really like to keep my eye on the ball there. Work closely with your SDRs. If you're an SDR on here, work really closely with your AE. Um, discuss openly what's needed there to help build pipelines. So when you're setting yourself up to go into Q1 and really shift that focus, you know, we, we have a saying called, it's, a, it's from a Tony Robbins speech on our team. Uh, we have the saying of burning the boats of like, you don't leave anything behind, like close out everything you can close out in the year. And so sometimes you start out Q1 and you're like, oh God, what <laughs> now what? Because I just closed everything out, right? So trying to balance that, having that open line of communication with your SDR. Um, I love helping my SDRs prospect. Let's get our list of accounts. I'm going to go into LinkedIn. I'm going to build lists for every single one of these accounts. These are the people I want you to go after. Here's the cadence that we're going to use to go after these folks. If it's, you know, six touches in and you're not getting any traction, assign the steps to me. I'll go in, run some emails, you know, video, whatever, um, with my SDR and really tag team it. So it's not just you handing over a book of business and having them schedule whatever they can schedule for you. Because, you know, while you're burning the boats in Q4, Q1 is right around the corner and you've got to have stuff, you know, you've got to have a full pipeline then. So you know, lean on your team around you, but make sure that you're not taking your eye off the prize from a prospecting perspective. And, and Katie, actually, to your point, there might be renewals, but not all of our, a lot of our renewals, um, <clears throat> there are a lot in Q4. There's a lot in the other quarters of the year as well. So planning those out and maybe start having those upsell type conversations, expansion conversations. Don't wait to have those. Don't, don't assume it's a done deal because they're a customer because if you've been in sales long enough, everybody's made that mistake of like, hey, that one's in the bag, they're a customer, they're going to renew and then you get, you know, a month out from renewal and you're getting like notifications that you don't want to be getting on your account. So um, balancing, I think that as well of um, just knowing what's in your book um, will help, I think, make sure that you're also set up for a really successful, you know, Q1 and Q2, just knowing the length of these sales cycles that we have to deal with. Yep. Um, and, and what I'm hearing is you know, there's consistency throughout the year. It can't all be banking in Q4. And I, I think that's, that's something we all, 
intrinsically no, although there is something to be said about the magic of Q4. I'm been, Paige, I'm going to come back to you with this. There is a different sort of momentum in the, the end of the year. Um, you know, I saw something on LinkedIn today, the dreaded, like, let's push this to January or let's push this until after, because now we have these landmark dates coming up. Um, mm -hmm. How are some ways that you ensure, maybe in real time, that, that you don't lose momentum in a deal? Um, or, or even just the next step, it might not even be to close this, but keeping that momentum moving. Yeah, that's where I was going to kind of go with it. I think we've talked a lot about, you know, the importance of timing around closing your deals, but there are a lot of deals in flight that, that aren't forecasted to close in Q4. But what I find happens in Q1 are things like reorgs and SKO and all of the things and you get through the holidays and all of a sudden they're like, well, you know, we have like a week of planning and we're doing this reorg and we're getting a new leader and then we have SKO. So let's do February. And all of a sudden your meetings that were happening and had some momentum in October, November, you're staring at, no, at February two months out because there is always, there's always going to be an excuse to push something out. So going back to the importance of having a plan, um, one of the air, like personal growth areas for me has been trying to formalize some of that. I am a relationship builder by nature. I'm probably too trusting in some ways where I might be like, okay, someone, this is what we discussed. The person said they're gonna do that. Well, there's a saying that you've all probably heard it buyers are liars they don't mean to be they just are that way sometimes so really getting that formalized into a plan that can be written down in email that can be an excel spreadsheet i've been using this nifty little tool called recapped.io um mark the founder of that company will be happy that i dropped that on this call but um it's a it's an awesome little tool that helps you keep track of all of your success plans. You can put steps in there, dates, due dates. You can assign things to people. Really helps you, and you get to see whenever anybody's looking at your plan, which I is my favorite feature. Obviously, being at Salesloft, um, we have a lot of um, stock, stocking type capabilities within our own platforms. I appreciate when others also do the same, um, and just really kind of making sure that you have a more even if it feels awkward at first, like a more formal way to hold people accountable to dates. And I was thinking, you know, Katie, when you were talking through timing earlier, I actually think it's a great way to pressure test your deal. If you have somebody who is saying, oh, well, you know, Thanksgiving's out, Christmas is out, like I'm not gonna be able, if you have somebody who's very wishy-washy about staying committed to deadlines, even in the busy times, that's just a, that's just a, you know, something that's feeling, it's telling you something about your deal and the urgency on your deal, I think. So um, really formalizing ways to keep people accountable and then kind of pressure testing that throughout, I think helps to uh, drive the momentum through uh, the holiday season to make sure that, you know, people are sticking to what they've committed to. Yep, I think that's a great point. Um, and we're we're seeing some great questions come in. Quick reminder, everyone, keep dropping in your questions, drop them in the chat, drop them in the ask a question box there at the bottom. We, we will get to them here shortly. Um, I think we've talked a, a lot about some really good points around individuals and what individuals can be doing to, to ensure that they're set up for success. Um, Katie, I wanna throw it to you from a company perspective because I think we probably have some sales managers listening who want to know what they can be doing to set their teams up for success um, during these months. So can you speak a little bit to that as someone that has been a manager and, and um, you know, is now in this more individual contributor kind of seat? Um, what are some things Handshake's done well and, and even other things that you've seen work well? Yeah, I think that uh, manager is like 99% of the game. Uh, I think that if I could give my 22-year-old self a little bit of advice, it would be who you work for matters a lot. And I think that uh, I undervalued that early in my career because I thought it was so important where I was working or what I was doing day to day. And I think Handshake has been a true breath of fresh air for me on that front. Um, I work for the most incredible person I've ever worked for in my life. His name is Chris Reiners. No, none of you can have him. Um, I will work for him as long as I can. Uh, we have an incredible VP of sales, Brett Scale, who I also got to work for for a long time in my manager role. So. I just highlight that because 
I think there's a difference between having a manager that you like, having a manager who's a good manager, and having the right manager for you. So assessing that throughout your career is also just super fundamental to getting the most out of what you're doing in that time. I think that it's not always the most important thing that you like your manager, uh, but it is important that you're learning something or they're your advocate or you feel like they're helping you to get to the next place or they're making you better. So there has to be some level of positive feedback loop that's happening for you during that time. Um, I think that for me now I feel like I've hit the jackpot because I get all of those things, uh, but that wasn't always true. And you probably won't get all of those things most of the time. Uh, but I highlight that because I think that one of the things that Handshake has done really well is when I look across our manager slate in sales right now, I could honestly say that I have worked with and I would work for anyone who is in a manager seat, which is pretty rare. Um, I think that in terms of that manager relationship with Q4 and working through this holiday season, for me, like use that person and managers be there for your team during this time. We're all very stressed. Uh, but this is really your number one brainstorm partner. What you do as a sales IC person impacts your manager's uh, bank account as well. So that is a good thing to remember. For most of the time, you're super aligned on wanting the same outcome. Uh, so I think that what I benefit from right now with Handshake is that I over communicate to my manager what's going on in my deals because if you're surprising your manager with bad news, that never goes super well. Um, so, and I'm talking through that risk analysis with him over time. So I'm saying these are the risks that I see in my deal. This is my idea for how I think we could navigate some of them. What do you think? So we have a really positive brainstorming session that happens once a week about my Q4 deals. Uh, so definitely lean into that, whether you're a manager or uh, an IC. Also, uh, your manager can be a, a token, like a person in your deal cycle. So for me, uh, Chris will always be my bad cop when I need it. Uh, I think about leveraging different individuals on my team to play a different role. If I own the relationship with someone, I don't need to be the person who's like, hey, I need this right now all the time. Sometimes I do, and sometimes that's the right muscle. But often if I could have him actually reach out just to their super senior person and say, hi, I oversee this team, I'm also a resource for you, it can just give a different touch point where the person who I work with directly doesn't feel offended because I'm not stepping over them, but we can do more of this executive alignment. I think that on that topic, that's one thing that uh, the CEO of Handshake like loves sales, uh, funny enough. And so he is always ex so excited to be involved. Um, and I would guess that if your companies like to make money, your CEO also likes to do sales. So that's been a really good thing here is that he will always volunteer to do any sort of executive alignment with my buyer. Uh, and you'll find that your, if your client, if your, if your potential buyer tends to go dark at certain periods of time where they're like not responding, you often have to come up with a new unique touch point. So that might be having your CEO reach out to someone, having your manager reach out to someone. So that's been really productive for me. Uh, the last thing that I'll note from a more tactical perspective is I know within the sales community, there are so many emotions that if you use Bant or Medic or whatever you might use, and everyone who uses one hates the other one for whatever reason. Uh, but at Handshake, what I found is we use something called Medic if you don't use it. It's just a way to grade your deal. Um, so Medic is a acronym where each of the letters stands for something you should know about your deal. So for example, the M stands for metrics. What are the metrics that's going to have this client look back and say that this worked? Or the C at the end, we add a C and we call it compelling event. So what is the event that's going to trigger them to buy? I think that one thing Handshake's done really well is they push us to give ourselves a grade across this medic scale. And you could do this for all of your accounts as well and all of the deals you're working. If you don't know the answers to medic, probably are going to lose the deal. And so it really helps us to get a sense of how ready are we. Um, and that's been a really tactical piece that's been helpful to me as well. I think that's great. And and Paige, you were nodding there. And I think you have perspective from so many different types of companies, um, but all, you know, very much at the enterprise level, you, you've worked with tons of different buyers, even now, it, we were talking about this before, but sales loft is known as like selling strictly into sales. But um, you were mentioning marketing gets very involved. 
there are, there are multiple people touching these deals. So what are some things that you think the team right now is doing well um, from a managerial standpoint or even a company standpoint to, to help people in, in Q4? Yeah. So I wanted to just um, tack on to wh what Katie ended with. So actually the last company I was at, we went through uh, force management training. They're really into the medic or med pick. Some people add a P in there for paper process. Um, anyway, there are lots of different ones, as Katie mentioned. I think the most important thing is to find something that helps keep you objective about your deals. We work with these people <laughs> sometimes for years. And, you know, I actually go get wine and dinner with my customers or prospects because these cycles take so long. It's really easy to fall into that trap. Again, maybe maybe I'm projecting the trusting of getting this thing done, of, um, you know, not having enough eyes on it and, and only trusting your, yourself on the deal. How do I keep myself objective? We do something similar at Sales Loft where you know, once a quarter, I'll take all of my deals like out of Salesforce, out of sales loft, and I'll stick them in an old fashioned spreadsheet and I'll start filling in information. Where am I missing? Where do I have gaps? And when that spreadsheet comes to life with my big bets or my deals and I start seeing gaps on them, I'm immediately like, okay, what's our plan to fill the gap? Right. Um, and that's where you can start kind of identifying flags and risks and getting ahead of those really early, I think is important. I also love the executive alignment play. I would say don't wait to do that. Um, get that, establish that as a part of your evaluation criteria. Hey, just so you know, my VP, my CEO, CRO, whoever, um, actually, it's just part of our process. They're going to reach out, establish a relationship with so-and-so. Do your research. Um, drop their CRO, drop their whoever, say, hey, they're going to reach out. And, and that's just a part of it. That way you're not waiting until the end. And then it looks a little bit desperate, like, oh, God, we better we better send this email because we haven't had any traction. Um, you know, another thing you mentioned, Katie, was just the uh, buying behavior. And like, if it's someone who goes dark, keep an eye on their behavior as you're working through that the process with them throughout the year. I definitely have customers who, or, or prospects who are, who really want that like weekly check-in. We're going to check in on our project plan. How is this evaluation going? Then I have customers who are like probably too many of them that are very much like, hurry up and wait. I need this thing. And then I'm not going to hear anything from them for three weeks. Back to our planning thing, incorporate that into your plan. You just need to know that <laughs> This is their MO, you give them what they need and it goes into a black hole for like three weeks and you're not gonna hear anything and that's just the way that it is. But at least again, you're keeping that objective viewpoint and you're managing expectations to say, hey, I know when I send this legal document, I'm not gonna get next day turnaround on it. I'm gonna get like three week turnaround on it, but that's okay because I've already planned that as a part of, of my process. So definitely some really great tactical things to take away from that. I'm also very lucky here at Sales Loft. I work for Jess Kleck. She's the best manager I've ever had. That has not always been the case. Uh, I've had all over the map of like micromanage. I've had hands off where you don't even like know where they are unless they're asking you for a commit number, you know, the last week of the month. Um, and everything in between. And I think something that Jess does really well is she puts on the armor and goes into battle with us on our deals. And I think that is something that is so critical at, at, a, at a sales manager level, especially at a company. I mean, Handshake's similar where we're in a similar place as far as I think company size and you know startup stage and all that stuff. You really have to have the player coaches I would send her, I would go into battle with her. I would send her into a call to your point. The good cop, bad cop play is, is something that we leverage. Um, the other thing that we do really well, I think is, is winning as a team. We don't just do QBRs and deal reviews to like beat a dead horse, right? We really want to come with what are our gaps? Where are you running into a brick wall? This is not to like defend your job or, you know, uh, 
pound your chest, right? Like we're coming to say, Hey, let's really problem solve on this deal. Um, and, and figure out a way that we can help you. We'll have people pulling up LinkedIn, looking at team connections, um, sending notes while we're on QBR, like, Hey, I worked with this person before. I'm going to shoot them a note right now, really just coming together to be strategic and, and think about problem solving our gaps on our deal. Um, we do that throughout the year. And I think it's something that's super helpful. And then you don't just feel like, Hey, I'm going to do this deal review that I feel like I've beat into the ground. You know, I I'm actually doing something that I think I'm going to get some real help from my team on that. So some great tactical takeaways, I think from, from Katie and, and just some ideas there. So. Yeah. And I think that the idea of doing the, the broader deal reviews with your entire team where others actually get more involved in the deals, I think it's very common to kind of go through like a pipeline rundown with your team, but it's, it's, I haven't heard of a lot of companies where, um, you know, the teams will actually get involved. And I think that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so lots of really good points. I do want to be mindful of time and we've got some good questions. So we're going to hop over to Q and a, um, for anyone who has questions, feel free to drop them in the ask a question box or on the side chat here. Um, but to kick it off, let's start with, um, let's start with Emily. Um, so Emily asked, how do you navigate complex deals and create urgency when there's a broker or a channel partner involved? Um, Paige, I'm going to kick this to you to, to start. Yeah. So I've actually never worked anywhere that has sold through the channel. However, I've had lots of customers that do that. Um, you know, Google's one of our big customers. They're heavily reliant on channel. I have, I have others as well. You know, I would say the answer is not that dissimilar uh, from some of the other answers that we've given here tonight. I know that partners introduce a level of complexity to the deal because it's just one more layer removed. I think the biggest thing you can do is have a success plan with the partner. Hold them accountable. Um, partners are notorious for coming to you with deals that aren't really real or you know, committing to things or not knowing what your process is. I think there's also something to be said. Are you selling a product that through the channel that is um, more of kind of a standard type purchase item, or is it something that is a complex sale? I would say make sure you have a great plan, especially if it falls more on that complex um, sale side of things. The partner is not going to, they're not going to do the selling for you, right? Like you can't depend on them to carry your the torch of your value prop to, to the end customer, right? So come up with a plan, whether that's co-selling together, whether that's um, taking ownership of some of the process, I would say utilize some of those tactical um, pieces of advice earlier. And honestly, if you are coming up, if there are, if you're constantly running into an issue with a partner, make sure that you're communicating that to your leadership because there are people that are responsible at the leadership level for ensuring that the partners you're working with are sticking on brand. You don't want a partner out there that's selling your responsible for selling your stuff that's not holding up their end of the commitment, that's, you know, constantly slipping on things or miscommunicating things. So I would say just make sure that if that is a if it's an issue, that you are communicating that internally because as a leader, that's certainly something they should want to know and, and, and care about. Totally agree. Um, and, and there's a lot to be said about the fact that a partner, no matter how great your partner is, is never going to sell better, sell your product better than you can. Um, so, so figuring out even ways to, I would say, thoughtfully insert yourself mm -hmm. uh, as much as possible. Yeah, there, I actually ran into a scenario uh, last week where we don't really sell through channel partners. We do more of like co-selling -co model with some of our partners. And there was a scenario where they wanted to, you know, kind of lock us out of, you know, the situation. And, and that was something I escalated immediately. And I said, you know, we can't, we can't have them doing this for us. It's not going to be successful if we just let them run with this uh, messaging. So, um, you know, we got the right people involved. It turned out there was actually some miscommunication on the back end and it was all sorted out. And to your point, now we're in the deal and having the conversations that we should be having and not relying on, you know, an external party to 
to Follow really up. do my, my job, right? So right. exactly. Um, Katie, anything you want to add to that? I would just say that also when you have like some sort of plan with those channels, if you can establish with them at what stage you're the most useful and do some of that communication up front. I think just overall, as and a lot of the questions that are being asked and just more broadly, a lot of it is just expectation setting from the beginning, which that's kind of the bad news because when you're in it, that doesn't feel that great. But it's also what helps you get better over time is you learn that, okay, these are the five things that tend to go wrong. So what I'm going to do is from the beginning, I'm going to address those things. And it just really helps to make sure that everything goes more smoothly because when expectations are set, no one gets depressed. I love that. A saying that we have internally that we talk about a lot is happiness equals expectations minus reality. Um, because when your expectations are misaligned and then reality inserts itself, that's when you tend to either be disappointed or frustrated or whatever else. Yeah. Um, yeah. Katie, I'm going to toss this next question over to you. So Sophia from Boston, very late, Sophia, thank you for, for joining in. I hope you're in your pajamas. Um, asked, uh, she's an account executive at Datadog, um, asked for any advice on driving urgency specifically in Q4 with smaller commercial companies. Yeah, so there's a great question. The first one is right back to that last topic, which is expectations. So this is the bad news. Uh, the bad news is if you're in it right now, you might not have set expectations at the beginning. Uh, but for starting today and every day after today, you do get to start expectations at the beginning. And why I think that matters is that tactically, um, how I think about expectation setting with the commercial segment or the mid-market segment is you get to tell them the rules at the beginning of when you start talking to them. So I think of it as you probably have some sort of first meeting with them where you're asking them a few questions. Okay, there's your discovery process. Then you're probably having some meeting where you're, you're giving a lot more. That's maybe your demo or your education call, how you're teaching them. Then every company gets super different after that stage. And there's lots of meetings that happen between the share, the give, get there up front and where you go. There becomes an incredibly critical meeting somewhere in this process where you tell them the pricing and you actually have, you say, this is how much it's going to cost for you. And you hope that before you do that, you have established enough of an understanding of value so that they have context for why the price is what it is. And they love it. They're so excited to pay that price that you tell them. Um, that almost never happens. But the expectation piece of it is that what you have the opportunity to do then is to tie all of your pricing to a date. And why this matters so much is I never send an order form, for example, that could just happen anytime. There's always a date associated with it. And I don't command that date to them. I talk to them about it. I ask, what's your ideal timeline for this? If you, if budget aside, if, if you could just have this whenever you wanted, when would that be? Okay, how could we map this for that timeline to be a reality for you? So those conversations are all happening somewhere in this pricing, packaging, negotiation phase. And what that enables you to do is make sure that this urgency thing isn't something you're trying to push at the 11th hour, but something that you have done earlier in the deal. Super common when I was overseeing uh, our mid-market and our commercial business, this was something that we often would see is that someone on my team would get to the end and they'd be like, oh shoot, I told them it was this price. And we never talked about when it would happen and now they don't want to sign it for a year. Uh, so a lot of that, unfortunately, the answer is that it happens earlier. But what I will say is now let's put the bad news in our back pocket and think about if you're in this situation now, what are the things that you can't do? And I think you have really three major things you can do here. One is map your product to calendar trigger positive experiences. So I don't know your company super well, but I'll just talk about at Handshake. Our business is a little cyclical. So students tend to want to get jobs in the fall and want to get jobs in the spring. Those are major recruiting cycles. So I can think about at each month in the year, what is the benefit to a company executing in that month? So for you, for everyone's own companies, think about what actually, why would I buy it today versus tomorrow? versus the next month, versus the next month. If the answer is there's no reason, then you do have an issue. But there usually is a reason that it would be positive for them to do it now. So that's kind of your more, I'd say, like honest, true urgency value proposition that is, is so critical and will help you the most. The second thing is to ask, just ask them. So if you're trying to drive urgency, say to them, what would it take 
for you to, for us to actually do this by the end of next week? What would it take? What would that look like? And if they say, I don't know, that means you have the wrong person. So what that means is now you got to reshift and think about, okay, well, if you don't know, no problem. How can we get someone involved in this dialogue? And I'm happy to bring in my manager. I'm happy to bring in my executive to actually have this conversation to get you what you're looking for. So that tends to give you a tactical way to help them involved, get involved in the urgency. It's not something you need to put upon them. Um, and then the last thing I'd say, and this is the cop-out answer, of course. So um, that last answer is always pricing. But to be honest, most of your buyers, they, they know if you're just trying to like throw a discount on a date. It doesn't feel good. And honestly, um, if you show up the next day and you still give them the discount, which a lot of salespeople do, then it's just a trust ruiner. So I'd say tactically, uh, you do have that in your back pocket to create pricing incentives. So do you have a lower price if they sign by next week or the week after? That only works if you also tell them what the price is after that date. So I see this error a lot, especially in commercial, where you're like, I'll give you a 25% discount if you send it by the end of the week. But they don't actually understand that if they sign it the next week, it's going to be X price. So I think, again, expectation, expectation setting is critical, but you can align your buyer proposition to a calendar. You can ask them because they will help you define urgency, especially if they want this. And lastly, you have pricing in your back pocket. So I think those are some great takeaways. Um, and, and I think a good note to everyone on holding firm, if you say you're, something is the way it is, stick to it. Um, Paige, I'm going to, I'm going to pop over to you for this next question. Um, so Leah asked, um, she's a first time manager. She said, any recommendations for motivating a team in Q4 when you're work from home? Yeah, so um, I've been on remote teams for the last four years. Um, I would say that's something that sells left and really just does um, very well. Um, when all of this stuff with COVID first started happening, um, we had lots of creative things that, that just kept us engaged from a team perspective. So we did things like bring your, like we brought our moms to Zoom one morning in a stand up. We brought our significant others. We brought our kids. We did lots of fun, um, you know, Jeopardy, trivia, all those types of things. So I would say don't forget to make it fun. I think so many times as a seller, like the meetings that you're in are pipeline reviews, deal reviews, uh, retros on, you know, win-loss reports. And they're always this like business type of scenario. And don't forget to, to keep it to keep it fun. Also, right now, things are tight for a lot of companies, but with the work from home, there are savings in other areas too. Like for us, you know, we're not doing lunch in the office anymore, which that was, I think, three days a week feeding 400 people, right? So it's like, hey, can you, can we talk about maybe taking some of that budget and reallocating it so that um, for our team meeting this week, I'm going to send everybody Uber Eats cards before the meeting, right? Or I'm going to kind of do some little spiffs for the team. We just announced some, some Q4 spiffs. Um, and actually, those spiffs were not for closing deals, but for moving deals through the pipeline, because we know historically things sit in stage two in our sales force before they move to stage three. Because for whatever reason, I feel like every company has that one stage where people hesitate to move it to the next one because then it's real on people's radars. So our we have a spiff now to say, hey, the team that moves the most deals into stage three you know, you're going to win money for your team and that can be spent. However, you can, you know, when the world is normal again, you can do an offsite or you can just distribute that however you want to your team. Um, so coming up with creative ways um, and I would say any chance you have to tie that to an incentive that's that's meaningful to the business like that, like that example I just gave the moving to stage three is going to help us all come Q1, Q2 next year, right? Because that means we're going to be further along in those deals. So that that's actually could be a good answer to some of our earlier questions as well about keeping some, um, you know, momentum and motivation through the holidays. Um, it, you know, it's amazing how attaching money to something gets people to think a little more creatively about, about a solution. Right. So um, yeah. So I guess my takeaways there would just be don't forget to have fun with the team. Don't don't make every single meeting a, a business meeting. Um, get to know your team, care about them personally and 
and have some fun and then also figure out ways, um, whether that means going all the way up uh, the flagpole to ask if there can be some reallocation of resources to use those in creative ways to, to incentivize your team for um, positive behaviors. Yeah, I think that's great. I, we've had a lot of fun with Airbnb experiences for anyone listening. Um, those have been really cool and the, the, um, the price ranges vary. Um, I think there's just a lot of creative stuff going on right now. So I, I love the like bringing people to standups. That seems so, so simple, but it's, that's a wonderful idea. Yeah. Um, this last question here, Katie, is actually for you. Um, so it said, be, this person asked, uh, because college recruiting is so cyclical, um, centered around fall and spring recruiting peaks, how does that change your end of year selling? Yeah, absolutely. So for everyone who's in the cyclical business, you know that there's an urgency tied to actually an event that's going to happen. But you also know that there's also panic when that event is going to happen. So if someone is like implementing Handshake the first day of fall recruiting, that is a very stressful experience for them, which is great for me, um, but also kind of bad for me because I'm also stressed, but it's, it's not a great setup. So everyone would prefer to be well set up, planned for, supported by the time that any event happens. So throughout the year, I change my talk track depending on where I'm at where it's a, okay, fall's happening. I mean, you literally have three days to sign this. So like you do you, but like uh, the career fair is on Thursday. So there really is uh, a true urgency that presents itself. But what I will say is that throughout the year, I could also talk about ability to onboard teammates, ability to do trainings, ability to drive higher adoption. I think that with any product, um, I used to think that companies bought something and then everybody used it. Surprise, that almost never happened. So companies buy things and then tons of people never use it. Uh, and so I think that when someone buys something, actually, when they buy something, they want everyone to use it. So building yourself a talk track around your implementation time or your adoption time is actually something that can help you avoid some of that cyclical mess. Um, and that's been really helpful for me. The last thing that I'll just note is I'm really, I, I see my sales role as a long-term game. Um, I think that one of the things that I hope has like is differentiating a bit is I'm not trying to like force everybody to buy my product. I don't think I'm a product pusher. I think a great salesperson actually can step back and understand what is the true value that my product delivers to this company. And if you do that, then by the time that you're talking to them about why they should do something, it's honest. And so there are times when I'll tell someone, Hey, I don't think you should do this right now. And that's okay. I can prioritize something else. So I think just if you can take the time to deeply understand your buyer, you'll be able to avoid a lot of the more like tactic type of things that uh, I see as shortcuts within our industry, where you give them that short discount for the next day, or you tell them that the product disappears in a week, or you tell them that they have to buy it now otherwise. So I think that a lot of it is... Uh, understand like work somewhere where you believe in what you sell because that's what makes it the easiest and then if you believe in what you sell then your job is less of a sales person and more of a storyteller and an educator about why a company will benefit from working with you and I think that that will help everything else happen um, so it's actually beneficial for both sides yep I think that's that's great um Paige, you were, you were nodding there. I'll leave it to you to kind of wrap us up. Anything, anything you would add on to that or any kind of final thoughts for, for folks as we finish up here tonight? Yeah, definitely some great points, Katie. I think um, one thing that I would tack on to that is don't forget that price isn't the only thing that can help drive urgency. Whether that's cyclical or whether it's just like your regular end of the year push to try to, or any quarter end push to drive urgency, Think about the things that you've discussed with them that they need. It might not always be a price cut. It might be, hey, we're really worried about implementation because last time we did this, it was a total mess. Well, maybe instead I'm actually going to give you like our best and brightest um, implementation resource and I'm going to give him to you for four weeks for free. That Those are also some things that you can use to drive urgency, to help drive adoption. Katie, totally relate with you on 
you think people buy your stuff and they're just going to use it. And that's just not reality, especially in the enterprise, because there's just so many competing priorities. So definitely something um, I would add on as, as, a, as a good tactic is keeping in mind of all of the maybe intangible things um, that they've that you've talked about that they care about that can also help uh, drive some urgency on the deal. But really love your point, Katie, on you don't ever want to be that person that's uh, you know desperately trying to to sell something to someone. Take that time to really care about how your product is impacting them, and that's how you're going to answer that urgency question for them. Um, and then uh, I guess the last thing I'd say is just um, getting to know quicker. Uh, that's the best, th the second best answer to yes is a no for a seller, right? Because then I know what I need to do or I can reprioritize for something else. So don't always take those no's as uh, the worst inf the, the worst answer, right? Um, that can be a good answer too, because then you can shift your time elsewhere, so. I think that is a perfect place to, to wrap us up tonight. Um, no is, what it, I think that's a John Barrows line. Knows the second best answer in sales. It um, is. I probably stole that from him. Yeah, tell we'll, him. we'll give we'll give Jay Barrows a little shout out. <laughs> there. Mark, hopefully. <laughs> uh, Katie Page, thank you so so much for being here. You two were fabulous. Um, for everyone who tuned in, thank you so much. Uh, I can't believe we had a handful of people from the East Coast. I know it's late there, but we're we're so thrilled to have all of you here. Um, again, please feel free to check out Women in Sales Everywhere.com for more of the programming the rest of this year. Um, also, learn about our individual members options um, to learn about any of our incredible sponsors. That's all also on the Women in Sales website. Um, Katie and Paige, thank you. Thank you. And thank you all so much. We will see you all very soon. Take care, everybody. Thank you.